Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I am Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you for joining us for today's follow-up hearing on supporting unpaid caregivers. Caregivers make up a crucial part of our aging community. Citywide, there are more than 900,000 caregivers providing critical support for a loved one, including children, caring for parents, grandparents, caring for grandchildren, and spouses and partners, caring for loved ones. These caregivers help their loved ones in daily tasks, from buying grocery to cooking, cleaning, providing transportation, helping care recipient bathe and dress and take medicine. They help their loved ones handle their finances and other legal affairs, and simply, at the end of the day, provide them companionship. Most of these caregivers are women and at least 50 years old, and over 50% of the caregivers provide at least 30 hours of care each week, and most of them are unpaid. While providing care for a loved one can be self-fulfilling for caregivers, research show that the stress and demand of caregiving can also have negative impact on their mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Moreover, caregivers experience higher levels of depression and mental health issue than non-caregivers, and they have a higher likelihood to develop serious sickness. Caregivers are also more likely to struggle financially than non-caregivers. With all of these challenges and the rising demand for caregivers, it is imperative that caregivers are supported both on the state level and on the city level. I will soon be introducing resolution to support the New York State Senate Bill 5100, sponsored by Senator Rachel May, and Assembly Bill A7209, sponsored by Assembly Member Harry Bronson, which will allow for a tax credit for qualified caregiving expenses. A tax credit for caregiving is certainly not enough to compensate caregivers for their tireless and often thankless work, but it is a step in the right direction for New York State. On the city level, the Council and the Department for the Aging have been working to examine and better the conditions for unpaid caregivers. In 2016, the City Council passed Local Law 97, which require the Department for the Aging, DIPTA, to develop and conduct a survey of unpaid caregivers and providers offering unpaid caregiving service in the city. After DIFTA was required to look at the result of the survey and create recommendation on how the city can better help address caregivers' needs. In 2017, DIFTA submitted the survey of informal caregivers in New York City. And based off those results, in 2018, the agency submitted to the council a plan to support unpaid caregivers in New York City. In November 2019, two years after the initial survey, DIFTA submitted to the Council a Caregiver Surveys Progress Report to outline what the agency has done to better serve caregivers based on their past survey and recommendations. Today, the Council wants to look at and thoroughly discuss all three reports the initial survey, the findings, the recommendation, and the progress report itself. Importantly, DIFTA's 2019 Caregiver Survey Progress Report highlights steps the administration have taken to address the needs of caregivers. This includes doubling DIFTA's caregiving, uh, contracting caregiver program budget, administering a caregiving support media campaign, and testing new transportation models in partnership with the mayor's office for people with disabilities. While these steps are in the right direction, 
I'm still concerned about the agency's reach and impact when it comes to ensuring that caregivers are aware of the services available to them. According to the fiscal year 20 preliminary mayor's management report, less than 11,500 people receive information and or support services through DIFTA's caregivers program. In a city with more than 900,000 caregivers, 11,500 is not enough. This is not even 2% of the city's caregiving population. DIFTA clearly has more work to do. The city clearly has more work to do. Today, I look forward to learning more about DIFTA's strategy to expand its outreach and broaden its impact. I also would like to highlight my concern about DIFTA's 2018 comprehensive plan follow-up report. The report with just six pages fall short of being comprehensive. I look forward to learning more about the agency's process for developing its reports and how the agency plan to move its recommendation forward. I would like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Uh, our council, Nusat, Chidari, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Johini Sopora. I would also like to thank my deputy chief of staff, Marianne Guerra, and I'd like to thank uh, the member of the committee who have joined us today, uh, council member Diaz, council member Ayala, and council member Eugene. So now I would uh, ask our council to administer the affirmation to the witness from the mayoral administration. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Um, both of you, sorry. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Welcome, Commissioner, and Happy New Year, because I haven't uh, seen you at the hearing. This is our first of the year. Oh, <laughs> Happy New Year, and it's great to be here again. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Chin and members of the Aging Committee. As you know, I am Lorraine Colte Vasquez, Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, and I'm joined uh, today at this important hearing by Carolina Hoyos, the director of our caregiving services unit. Also uh, have some colleagues uh, from sister agencies, the mayor's office of for people with disabilities as well as the agency for children's services have joined us as well as two of the DIFTA colleagues uh, who are involved with this program, our assistant commissioner Eileen and, um, and um, our chief executive officer, um, Michael Ognebetti, all right? Um, so I will go back to my testimony. As you well stated, there was an estimated 1.3 million caregivers called, uh, who call home, uh, New York City their home. And given the uh, current data compounded by the segment of the population who do not self-identify themselves as caregivers, it is likely that the total population of caregivers in our city is far greater. Thus, I am incredibly grateful to Chair Chin and the entire Aging Committee for its continued advocacy and partnership and support for this important community in New York City. Chief among the many achievements together is the passage, as you say, well said, of Local Law 97 of 2016. This law empowered DIFTA to develop a comprehensive survey in partnership with our other colleagues in government, including the New York City's Administration for Children's Services, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, and the Mayor's Office of Operation. This thoroughgoing citywide survey endeavored to better understand the needs of these 1.3 million New Yorkers examine the extent to which unpaid caregivers' needs are met by existing services 
and to identify areas for improvement. It ultimately yielded significant, uh, significant findings, which through the support of a diverse work group resulted in the total of seven recommendations. And this work group consisted of the sister agencies that I uh, referenced earlier. The recommendations are leverage and expand awareness about existing resources for caregivers. Encourage New Yorkers to identify as caregivers. Educate caregivers about best practices and techniques for providing care. Help caregivers access affordable transportation. Support legislation that benefits unpaid uh, caregivers. Continuing a work group focus on caregivers and communicating affordable housing efforts and opportunities to caregivers. In January 2018, DIFTA produced and released a plan to support unpaid caregivers in New York City, detailing these recommendations and in our ongoing efforts to raise awareness and inform best practices for the caregiver community and those who serve them. The findings and recommendations continue to guide DIFTA's efforts as well as directly inform our programs which support the caregiver community. For instance, <clears throat> a lack of awareness among New Yorkers to self-identify as a caregiver and limited access to available resources are the most cited concern of our survey respondents. As a direct result, DIFTA launched a public outreach and advertising campaign, which included advertisements in subway lines, on buses and bus shelters, the Staten Island Ferry, and on billboards across the city, including a billboard on Times Square. Our primary message was twofold. One, to help caregivers recognize that in fact they are caregivers. And two, to encourage them to seek assistance through the Department for the Aging by simply dialing 311 and asking for caregiving support. According to 311, the city received 1,600 caregiver inquiries following that campaign. This represented a significant increase relative to the prior years uh, to prior to the campaign being launched which only saw a fraction of those numbers. Moreover, DIFTA conducts direct outreach by way of participation in various pa panels or public speaking opportunities. In FY19, DIFTA and Bellevue Hospital <clears throat> joined forces to conduct presentations about DIFTA-funded services to doctors, nurses, social workers, and case managers. And we have held similar presentations at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, Harlem Hospital in the Upper Manhattan, and the New York C City Health and Hospital case managers and social workers. In addition to offering direct support and assistance, DIFTA-funded caregiving programs across the city are also contracted to identify and locate isolated caregivers and provide information about available services. Also guided by our survey findings, DIFTA's network of contracted caregiver providers meet regularly and as often as necessary by the program needs or the industry design uh, demands. These meetings have included discussion on industry-specific challenges, such as the increasing costs of respite care and the overall shortage of home health aids. Meeting discussions also identified trends impacting the need for caregiver supports, such as long-term care planning, although we always advocate living in your community and aging in place, and specific needs of in immigrant caregivers, including language needs and immigration status-related challenges. Additionally, our providers received technical assistance and directives regarding documentation and tracking of service units and funding. Periodically, expert guest speakers are invited to, to, guess, to, in, to discuss nuanced or cutting edge information, resources, and programs related to issues 
from Alzheimer's and dementia care to legal assistance to case management support. These meetings provide the opportunity to improve service provision, enhance practices and techniques, and elevate the caregiver service industry in New York overall. These are just a few examples of the ways in which our survey informs our recommendations and were put into direct practice by our staff and continue to inform the work uh, and that of our contracted prop, uh, providers. I would be remiss, however, not to mention the incredible investment made by the city of New York and the mayor in this space. This administration added $4 million in baseline funding that enabled us not only to advance our survey recommendations and expand services to address newly identified unmet needs, including one of our greatest challenges, which is respite-related support. This administration's commitment to caregivers is further reflected in the city's unprecedented investment in the prevention of services to help support and strengthen families caring for children. ACS is nationally recognized and broad array of contracted prevention services have served almost 20,000 families with more than 4, uh, 45,000 children in FY19. These services are free for New York City children and their caretakers and offer a broad range of supports, including in-home counseling, referrals, assistance with uh, accessing benefits, and homemaking. Our outreach efforts and media campaign encourage many New Yorkers to self-identify as caregivers, which in turn resulted in more caregivers seeking specific support as respite and supplemental services. As noted during the Aging Committee's last caregiver hearing in November 2017, which I was not present at, DIFTA projected doubling our respite uh, service goals to caregiver clients by the end of 2019. And in 2017, the year prior to the mayor's investment, there was a total of uh, 37,089 hours of some type of respite care. This included individual home care, group respite, overnight and other respite, and supplemental services. In FY19, the combined hours of respite care, supplemental services provided were 118,843, far exceeding our expectations, only further encouraging us to continue our efforts within this community. As noted earlier, DIF the contracts with several community-based caregivers, providing a total of 12 caregiver programs across the city. Um, we have two per borough. In the Manhattan, I mean, in the Bronx, we have Presbyterian Senior Services and Neighborhood Shop. In Queens, we have Sunnyside Community Services and SNAP. In Brooklyn, we have Jasser and Heights and Hills. And in Staten Island, we have the uh, Jewish Community um, Center. And in, Le in Manhattan, we have ha Lenox Hill and Hamilton House. In addition to the programs based geographic on geographic catchment areas, we also have Sage, Hamilton House, Hamilton Madison House, and Visions, which serve targeted communities such as LGBTQ caregivers, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese speaking caregivers, and the visually disabled caregivers, respectively. The population of 1.3 million caregivers is undoubtedly reflective of the ethnic and cultural composition of the city as a whole. Therefore, the area of diversity and inclusion was not only a recurrent theme in our survey findings, but in the ongoing work in general. The intersection between caregivers and, and the immigrant population is broad, and language barriers severely impact access to caregiver services. Accordingly, DIFTA addressed cultural and language-based barriers directly through the procurement process for our caregiver contracts. Specifically stated in the latest RSP, uh, RFP, for instance, contracts are expected to interact and provide services to clients in a culturally and linguistically competent manner. 
That is in all of our contracts now. Additionally, outreach efforts are expected to be culturally competent, linguistically appropriate, and sure that those being sought out represent the economic and social cultural diversity of the program service area. Community linkages, targeting, and outreach remain important qualifications for our contracts and are, and are heavily weighted in consideration in our evaluations of all proposals. DIFT imposes this expectation directly on ourselves as well. Our, us, our caregiver services are provided to individuals who speak Spanish, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, Filipino, Greek, Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, and Japanese. Additionally, DIFTA has developed e-learning videos specific for caregivers, which have been translated into Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Italian, French, Creole, and Greek, and are available on DIFTA's website 24 hours a day. These efforts remain a priority for DIFTA because services must reflect the rich cultural and linguistic diversity of New York City. There are, however, attributes specific to New York City, which are less celebrated and much more difficult to address. These include housing affordability, affordability and access to affordable transportation, which are surprisingly also among the top concerns of our uh, survey respondents. Excuse me. Many caregivers, particularly those caring for older adults, have expressed dissatisfaction with the limited and sometimes impractical options available to them. Cra uh, traveling across every borough, if you live in the Bronx, it can be a challenge and continue to be a challenge if you don't live near a bus or a subway station. Fortunately, DIFTA's caregiver programs are able to reimburse or arrange for transportation services to caregivers, which is among the various supplemental services made possible with the additional uh, four million dollars funded in FY18, which has been baselined. Further, DIFTA has a total of eight standalone transportation programs across the city to provide van and private car services for New Yorkers over the age of 60. Transportation services can include trips to and from an older uh, adult center, medical appointments, and, and others as needed trips. Finally, several of our 249 older adult centers also provide uh, services, and these are available for the caregiver community. Accessible and affordable transportation is one of the greatest needs that transcends the caregiver community and the older population. Similarly, housing affordability is a major concern for all New Yorkers, caregivers and non-caregivers alike that far exceeds DIFTA's reach. Nevertheless, the administration remains committed to increasing the amount of affordable and accessible housing for everyone, including older adults. The city has made an unprecedented commitment to the creation and preservation of affordable units for older New Yorkers. A total of 30,000 units are to be developed and preserved between 2014 and 2026 targeting people aged 65 and over. DIFTA will continue to advocate for these important efforts, and undoubtedly, we count on the council as well. Thanks to Local Law 97, the de Blasio administration's deep commitment to this work, and the ongoing advocacy of this Committee on Aging, we have covered many great concerns specific to the caregiver community, and more in importantly, have identified ways to address them. We look forward to our continued dialogue and partnership with the City Council, centered around how better understand and serve the needs of this caregiver community in New York. I'm pleased to answer any questions that you may have at this moment. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your testimony. And yes, you know, we're very happy uh, to see uh, some progress, and also thanks to the advocates, uh, especially AARP, for uh, helping us advocate for that $4 million <laughs> back in 2017. 
Um, I and think that we're was grateful part of, too. <laughs> I think that was part of the year of the senior. Um, <laughs> right? So um, I'm just gonna start with a couple of questions and uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. You did talk about um, some of the, the challenges that caregiver uh, face, the challenges, and you were talking about your, the media campaign. Is that campaign continuing, or it was just for that one year? We, go ahead, Carolina. So the media campaign continues in different ways. Um, during fiscal year 18, it was in um, the buses, subway trains, in the Staten Island Ferry. We had the billboards in the Grand Concourse. We had it in Coney Island. We had it on the Lower East Side and in Times Square, as the commissioner mentioned. And we also have uh, ongoing on DIFTA's social media. We also have printed material that continues um, to uh, year to date, which encourages caregivers to respond uh, by calling to 311 and asking for caregiving support. And at that time, they are then connected with one of our 12 uh, caregiver service providers, depending in the area that they reside. So if they call from Staten Island uh, to, and they say that to 311, 311 will transfer them to the Jewish Community Council Center, and they will be able to start talking about their caregiving needs with that program. So continuous outreach and education continues in a variety of forms. The billboards are, not, are no longer in existence, and uh, that part of the campaign has terminated. What about this on the subways and the bus? I mean, what we want to track is the, the, the caregiver's family. Uh, if they see some information, then they might be able to kind of let their parent know that, oh, I saw something on, on, in the subway that can provide you know, resources to help with grandma, right? So I think that's something that is, we should figure a way of yeah. working with the MTA to continue. Thank you for that. We, that's, we'll take that under very serious consideration to make, figure out a way to continue in ex, uh, robust outreach efforts. Yeah, because one, uh, one of the things that was identified um, in the report and also from your testimony, people don't identify themselves um, as caregivers until something happened. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, the, the organization that provide the services are great, uh, but how do we reach, you know, the more than 900,000 to more than a million caregivers? And also some of the programs, um, like the transportation program, like the, the respite care. Every year, we still have waiting lists for the home care program, right? And I know that we've been advocating for more resources for that, because that is such a wonderful program to give the unpaid caregiver some relief. And a lot of people still don't really know that that program is available. And for the, the families that we're able to help, uh, just an example from my district office, it makes such a big difference um, in the caregivers' lives. I mean, one uh, elderly um, senior, you know, who take care of her husband, she said now she can go swimming three times a week. <laughs> oh, she can go to the bank. Another one said, I can go get a haircut yeah. and not worry about my husband being alone. Uh, and these are the people who actually work very hard and they might have a pension and they don't qualify for Medicaid, right? And here we have a program that can offer these caregivers some relief and we really need to make sure that resources are available and also to make sure that they know about it. Uh, so I, I'm gonna ask for your forgiveness if I gave the impression that continuous education and outreach is not going on. It is going on extensive. What we don't have is a subway and bus campaign, so I want to make sure. So there is constant um, reaching out to communities to help people identify as caregivers. And that happens both through the eight providers as well as our efforts to inform 
other communities, such as hospitals and other service providers outside of this network, so that they're familiar with the services. So that is an extensive effort that we have. That is an ongoing effort. In addition, I would like to say that um, there is, a, I'm very pleased to say that there is no waiting list for respite care right now in our grandparenting programs. So that is something that we've been monitoring very carefully. In the grandparenting program? In the, in the, in the caregiving, sorry, in the caregiving program. So there is right now, there's no wait list for home health aides, the home care, the, the ISEP program. For respite care. So for respite care, ISEP is not connected with the caregiver programs. So with the respite services um, that are accessible to family caregivers in New York City through our 12 providers, there's no wait list for the respite care, which can be in-home uh, respite, it could be group respite, or it could be overnight respite at a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility. So the in-home respite is where there is a, a home health aid that comes? Yes, so in the caregiver programs, in-home respite is when a home health aide comes in to offer respite to the caregiver by caring for that care receiver. And the caregiver programs have uh, funding available to serve different types of respite requests that are received from caregivers reaching out to them from the community. So with that program, how many hours? Or it's just happened this one day, I'm not available, you know, I have an important appointment that I'm not gonna be available, and then I call this program, and they have someone there for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So it's based on their assessment and their discussion with the caregiver. Um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, so if I'm a caregiver in that situation and I call the program and I say, you know, every Thursday I have physical therapy for my knee and I cannot leave my husband alone, the caregiver program will conduct a caregiver assessment and they will talk with the caregiver to determine for how long they're going to need the respite. Let's say she says two weeks or a month and then what they do is they make the arrangement with the contracted home care provider. They're all licensed home care providers that the caregiver programs contract with, and so they arrange for a home health aide to appear at the caregiver's home on the days that she has physical therapy so that she can go ahead for her appointment and someone will be able to stay with the, husband, with the spouse and be able to um, make sure that their needs are met. So are there any coordination between that and uh, the home care program, the ISEF program? Because most of the people who apply, I mean, some of them, maybe, um, they need the home health aid. And in some of those families, they all have like spouse taking care of um, another spouse or a child, I mean, an adult child taking care of older parents. And that program is more regular. I mean, once you get assessed and they say, okay, we can provide 12 hours a week. So you know that these 12 hours will, will be ongoing for a while and then you can kind of plan your schedule. You can either work during those time or, will you, 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 know, or you can do other things. So I, I mean, I don't know why it's not you know, connected. Because those they're are the not, caregivers. They're not that, disconnected, yeah. all right? So, when we look at provision of service, we look at it's very client-centric, right? And I wanted to also address an earlier statement, which is, as you as you may be aware, we've received state funding mm -hmm. uh, to address the the wait list uh, for home care, and that's ongoing. And the uh, the wait list has been addressed, um, and we're not. We're, I mean, it's, it's not an issue for us anymore, and it's a continuous thing that we're monitoring. Um, but it is ongoing, and they're not, they're not totally ice, uh, siloed programs. Yeah, I mean, that might have been a lot of the, the unidentified yes. caregiver who might be, should know about this program, <laughs> too. Yeah, because the people that we work with, they did not identify themselves as caregiver. But they were really happy to hear about the program. And then now, because they're connected, so now they know more what other resources 
are available. And that's what this local law and this additional service provision that we've done together has enabled. Um, it's so not only are you you're getting an entry point. What is it that we say? No door left unopened. You have an entree into a wider array of services that you may not have even known that you were eligible for or entitled to. I mean, one of the things that I mean, one of the programs that the council support with discretionary funding is the nine uh, social adult daycare program that we provide discretionary money every year so that they could provide more services to seniors who don't have Medicaid uh, because the private one only takes seniors with Medicaid. Uh, so, but that is also another program that's supposed to be able to be available to help caregiver. Uh, and it makes such a big difference um, to the caregiver that you put your parent you know, in a facility where you know that they're gonna have activity, they're gonna be taken care of for a couple of hours, and then you can do your whatever you need to do. And they are in a safe place, or when they, and they also provide transportation. Yeah, there's a close collaboration with those programs, a very close collaboration, as we have a close collaboration with uh, two of the sister agencies who are very much invested in this arena also. Yeah, and that's why, you know, that's why it frustrates me when a lot of the private one, I mean, they don't provide this resource um, to our, you know, caregivers, their family, the seniors, and that's the frustration. We only have nine uh, in the city that the government support so we really need to look at how do we, you know, expand the services, which is so critically needed um, for our seniors who needs the, the caregiving. Um, so and, and you know that we're pleased that the laws, the ombudsman law to uh, local law nine for uh, social adult daycare, it's, they get promulgated in just a matter of days and so we're, really pleased to have have that fully operational soon. Good, and I hope you have enough staff <laughs> to able to like work on this so to make sure that good programming are available um, to our seniors. Just a little bit on the, um, Council Member Yellow, you have a question? You have some questions before I, I go to? Go ahead, don't worry. I would just, uh, just on the, uh, the 2018 uh, Comprehensive Plan follow-up report, um, you talked about um, all the recommendation, but the, the Comprehensive Report was very short. <laughs> so um, maybe you could go into a little bit of that. Maybe you just kind of like just sum it up and this is what needs to be done because we were sort of surprised that it. Um... The, um, this is the 2018? No, no. Um, I'm not sure, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the 2018 report was issued prior to the $4 million infusion. Is that accurate? The report was uh, submitted in the beginning of fiscal year 18, and so the infusion came later that year, in later in 2018. So some of the re some of the progress that we've talked okay. about is post that report. Okay, so and it's some of the enrichments and the continuous work is post that report, and the expansion of service providers is post that report. Okay. So I know the four million is great, but are we advocating for more? I know it's baseline, which is great. Yes. But four million more doesn't cover the uh, so number of caregivers that are in the city, or even increase the percentage of caregivers that we will be able to reach. 
That, with the additional four million that we get from the state Title III money, brings our resources to eight million. And as we all talk, we also know always, and I will, you know, my answer is, uh, needs always outpace resources, and we will continue to work with you and this administration, whose strong commitment to make sure that we can provide services that are required. Because I think definitely there will be a need, because once, you know, we do extensive outreach, more people know about the program, they're going to start applying, and you're going to need, we're going to need more funding to accommodate, right? <laughs> That's that's the purpose of, for the outreach. Um, and the other question I have is that, is it part of the, um, the contract uh, with the providers to do training for caregivers, to be able to take advantage of all the, the training programs that we have, you know, like there, the Thrive, the mental health, so that they are more- There's a strong tie with, with the geriatric mental health programs. There, uh, there's various trainings that we do for caregivers, particularly in appropriate ways to provide care, uh, to prevent uh, harm or damage or injury. There is also the uh, the four monographs, the videos that we provide of uh, for caregivers on some of the duties and responsibilities around um, caregiving. We also provide training on legal and financial um, supports for caregivers, more information on how to address some of those issues. Those are the videos that are on your website. Yes. Right? Yeah. So how In do multiple we, languages. So how do you um, sort of circulate those, let people know that those are there? Do you, send, do you actively send it out to uh, providers and also, I mean, like all the people that you outreach to? That's a good question. Um, and the way that that training videos are being um, shared is that the providers are aware of it. It's accessible via YouTube, so they're able to share them, send the links, also play them at their locations. Uh, the caregiver programs are also contracted to offer trainings, um, as the commissioner stated, and so they offer trainings based on the feedback that they're receiving from the caregivers in their community regarding financial and legal, a lot of the planning around finances of the person they're caring for. We also partner um, with our um, sister agency from Department of Veterans Services and the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene and had the directors and staff of our caregiver programs trained in mental health first aid for veterans in order for them to assist the caregivers. So we have 51 council members, so I think that we should figure a way of getting oh. that information, you know, the, so that we, each of us can help circulate um, to people on our e-blast list, uh, service provider, um, our constituents, I mean, that is really a good way to really get the word out too because you have providers from different boroughs, so we could focus on those and the citywide. I think that's something that we can uh, be helpful with getting the information out throughout the city. Thank you for that recommendation. Okay. Uh, I was just informed that, thank you for that, Edgar. Uh, I was just informed that we also have issued press releases around the video and the availability of the video to, to enhance the public's knowledge. Okay. Also, can you uh, provide uh, uh, the council, the committee, uh, with the uh, contracting agencies and the services that they uh, should be providing? Um, sure. We can give you a list of the agencies and the contracted services. Uh, the the eight geographically based, as well as the three uh, citywide, um, and we'll provide that for you by the end of this week, no okay. later than close of business. Okay. I mean, we want to be a partner. We want to be helpful um, to get the program out. Uh, personally, for me, uh, my family, my brother, we benefited. We, we, we were referred by Hamilton Madison House to talk to the caregiver program, and they were really helpful. 
Um, Glad to hear that. So that we want to make sure that everyone uh, who needs the service, because the aging population is growing. Yes. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, people can access resources and information. I'm going to pass it on to Council Member Ayala with some questions. I just wanted to just augment something that you said. We are partners in this. And so not that we want to be, but we are. All right. Great. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, so as Good part afternoon. of the uh, as part of the survey that was inspired by Local Law 97, one of the seven recommendations included uh, communicating affordable housing efforts and opportunities to caregivers. Does that, did that in any way include um, any technical assistance to individuals residing within public housing um, that was serving as a caregiver? Because we often see through constituent services. Uh, displacement of individuals that moved in with a parent or a family member that was suffering from some sort of ailment um, and then the person passes away they didn't realize that they were supposed to be on the lease or didn't realize it was supposed to be on the lease for a year um, and end up you know uh, evicted so is that part of the recommendation that you know of? what I can tell you is um, the recommendation was to just was mostly centered around any kind of modification a caregiver may have needed for their home, all right? And so how is it that you make your house ready for? Um, and so what we did was we helped them and some of the services for ramps and additional spaces and things that they may have need. So that's what it really centered around. As it evolved, it was real clear that housing information was necessary. And one of the things that there is a close linkage, as there is a close linkage with all of the DIFTA programs, the DIFTA MAP program is also uh, very closely linked to this program, which is the, where we have contractors and staff working directly with NYCHA residents and in NYCHA high identified uh, need uh, pri uh, public housing. Yeah, I just, I feel like that should be, it, they, they, they go kind of hand in hand because you know, unfortunately, a lot of these unofficial caregivers, you know, leave their place of employment because Absolutely. they can't afford to work and take care of, you know, family members and then end up now without a job and without a place to, to, to live. Um, that's that's really a, it's a great, huge, great huge recommendation yeah. and issue that we'll look into deeper. Um, now, as part of the, uh, the, the public uh, outreach and advertising campaign, my mom... Um, who's at home now with probably like three home attendants because the home care agency has some sort of mix up going on. And so her home attendant is there. My father was sent two home attendants three days consecutively. She's probably going mad. But prior to her getting a home attendant of her own, she served as my father's primary caregiver. Um, she cannot uh, for you know physical uh, reasons. She, she, she just can't physically get in and out of the subway. She does not travel via uh, public transportation at all. Um, how does it, you know what, what would what's the strategy for communicating the efforts of DIFTA's caregiver program and the services available to individuals that are that isolated? So one of the things that uh, we work with our providers when we meet regularly um, is being able to address strategies in regards to outreach and presentations and how to reach folks through word of mouth. Um, that is the uh, big focus on also the uh, presentations with doctors, nurses, and social workers, because where are most caregivers? They're in hospitals and they're in medical appointments. And so if the physician, if the nurse and the social workers are aware uh, of the DIFTA services, then they're able to say, why didn't you make your last visit? Oh, well, it's because I couldn't find transportation. I had a difficult time getting there. So a lot of the outreach efforts are focused on working with uh, medical professionals because that's um, the professionals who are coming in most contact with uh, the caregivers that are not accessing the internet, who are not on social media, but they're able to uh, be seen on a follow-up basis during their medical appointments. I think, I think that that actually is an excellent way of communicating, and I have been um, hearing more and more uh, lately of how individuals are 
inadvertently connected to, uh, you know, somebody at the clinic that recognized that they were, you know, showing signs of, you know, of stress and just, you know, feeling overwhelmed and that somebody was actually paying attention and picked up on the cue that, you know, this person was a caregiver and probably was, you know, also now experiencing some sort of, you know, uh, of burden um, that was manifesting physically and mentally and we're able to connect them. So I'm really excited about that. However, is that a service that's extended also to senior center uh, staff? Because, you know, senior center staff are very overwhelmed. There's usually one case worker that's working with, you know, God knows how many people are coming in with a multitude of issues. Oftentimes, you know, you have time for lunch and maybe you can, you know, have a bathroom break. Um, and we're not always the most uh, informed because, I mean, listen, I'm a council member and I often have to catch up on the news because I'm so busy doing this that I don't have time to catch up on what's going on in current events, right? So it's very similar for them. They don't really always have the information that they need to better assist their clients, not because they don't want to, but because they're overwhelmed. So is there an opportunity to maybe present as if to have like workshops um, or presentations similar to that with the, care, with the, uh, the doctors at Bellevue and at Lincoln to better inform senior center staff, which are frontline on the services that you know are provided through this this program. We have uh, started at DIFTA, and along with our partner Live On, mostly through Live great On. Great partner. Great partner. Uh, but we also are looking at constant ways to train and bring new skills to older adult uh, center staff and that is a strong commitment. Um, but I can tell you that given the collaboration around transportation and some of those respite services, that kind of cross-collaboration and, uh, and cross-fertilization of services and knowledge is occurring. Uh, but I totally uh, agree with you in a more structured fashion. It's something that we would uh, look to. And one of our partners in, tra in training that network in that industry would be live on. And I, I think just piggybacking off of what Councilmember Chin was saying, even as it relates to our own staff, um, each community is outfitted with, you know, an abundance of constituent services staff, you know, in the local, you know, state senator's office, the state assembly member's office, the city council member's office that are, you know, also points of contact with individuals coming in. If there was an opportunity to host something like that at DIFTA, we do it at City Hall all of the time. Some other agencies, you know, do something similar where they would invite them to come in for, you know, a morning, an hour or two, where they, you know, just to kind of brief them on those services so that when they're providing, you know, information to the public, they have all of the information that they You can. know, we've done that on a request basis. Okay. I think what we will do, based on this conversation, is that we will issue from our government affairs uh, operation right. the opportunity to extend that to, to the city council members who may have not, and some of the assembly members who may have not requested or availed themselves of that service. And the other thing that I wanted to say, because I felt the eyes burning on me from this side of the room, <laughs> that Department for the Aging also has an extensive training program for all of our service providers on some of the state-of-the-art issues and needs that we've identified through other programs, and that we have a training academy. That's wonderful. Congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, I have two more questions, Margaret. I figured I could take up for Eugene and and the, the reverend, I'm taking up their time. Um, so when, when, when mounting the public awareness campaigns, um, are you specifically targeting or is there any attempt to specifically target communities that have seen a significant growth in the older adult population? That means every community in New York City. Uh, no, we obviously we are focusing where we identify the greatest needs occur. I think they're all in East Harlem. <laughs> There's some in the South Bronx and a, a, a few in the Lower East Side. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and finally, I just, out of curiosity, because when I did work um, in senior services, there was a respite program that uh, was being, that was offered, it was an overnight program for um, individuals suffering from um, Alzheimer's and it allowed families an overnight kind of 
you know, break. So they would come and pick them up. I believe it was in Yonkers. They would pick them up at around five or six, and then they would spend the night at this program because, you know, most of them did not sleep through the night, and so they offered activities um, and then brought them back in the morning, and it didn't conflict with home care services being rendered. So during the day, they had the home care services, and at night, they had the opportunity to, to go. Do, do you know of any such similar program, a similar model in New York City? Because I'm not familiar. Yes, Vision Program, um, who has, it's one of our premier partners. Like maybe I shouldn't say that we have too many of them. But it is an exceptional partner. Um, has a respite program where they will take individuals um, to Rockland County, I believe, is where their facility is, to just give them the respite um, and then make provisions for the care of the other individual. But they do have these respite facilities, and it, it's it's an amazing. But the program. services are uh, uh, at Rockland. They're not. There's nothing in. No, the they give them respite, real respite. Yeah. They send them away so that they can have some time. Go ahead, Carolina. Um, the providers also uh, partner with uh, assisted living programs, uh, some skilled nursing facilities, and other organizations that run overnight respite. And with the um, infusion of this administration of the $4 million, that's been a possibility because the cost uh, is now being able to cover through that additional funding that was provided. Thank you, thank you so much. Can you also uh, talk to us about the other agency? What is, the, what is HRA um, doing in terms of helping uh, caregivers? Like do they help them with you know, applying for benefits like SNAP? Um, and what other agencies? Um, we work most closely on the caregiving arena with the mayor's office for people with disabilities and with the agency uh, for uh, ACS, uh, Agency for Children and Services. And uh, those are the two primary partners as well as the Department of Health and Mental Health around caregiving. Are there any other that I'm missing, Carolina? Yeah, sure, thank you, Commissioner. Also, the Department of Veteran Services we're also partnering with them and making them aware of DIFTA funded uh, services as well as uh, DCASC, making them aware. I guess what HRAs is like helping the caregivers who are you know, spending most of their time doing caregiving and they might not be uh, working full time, so now their income is lower and they might be able to access some of the benefits like food stamps and other benefits. So one of the things that we've uh, done as part of the outreach with other sister agencies is we did conduct several presentations with the Department of Social Services, which includes HRA, and we did presentations about DIFTA-funded services and provided information of who the providers are throughout the city so that if they're in the process of working with caregivers um, that may need uh, services or information, they would have that information available. So we did several presentations to that department, that city agency. To HRA? To the Department of Social Services. So, oh, so yeah, services. which included yeah. some staff from uh, Human Resources Administration. So are they part, I mean, are they working with you to sort of like identify uh, certain staff that these providers can reach out to? You know, because oftentimes if you want to get, uh, you know, helping a caregiver to get benefits as quickly as possible, it's good to have a direct line so versus just going through. We collaborate in the sense that they often reach out to us when they find caregivers in need. Um, and so because they have a contact at the Department for the Aging, they know that if they come across, then they can reach out. So often we'll have um, folks not only from HRA, but from the Department of Veteran Services identify caregivers that they're coming into contact with and say, you know, we realize this person may benefit from your programs. Can DIFTA reach out? And DIFTA does reach out, discusses what the need is with that caregiver, and then um, connects them to our providers to be able to continue the assistance that's needed. Can you also tell us a little bit more about the transportation program? Um, how many, do we know how many caregivers are using the uh, Accessory pilot program? Um, 
I mean, that's a great program. You, you don't have to... Uh, we, we can't give you that level of specificity, but what I can provide you uh, by week's end with the, with, the other, with the other information that we have to give you is uh, the number of transportation services that are being offered to caregivers and the type of uh, transportation. Is that possible, Carolina? Yes, we can give you um, information on the transportation. It's called supplemental transportation that is available to caregivers through the caregiver program. So you can give us the number of uh, requests and how many? We can give you the number of uh, service, service units, yes, offered. The number, the number of services provided. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Oh, Councilmember Deutsch, welcome. Do you have any uh, question? Uh, yes. Well, we have to figure out how long we got to keep the commission. Okay. Do, you, do, you, do you want? Um, ah, you want to say that? Oh. Hi, guys. So, for the accessory so program. So, sorry, sure. Go ahead. Uh, are you from Moyer? Mayor's Office People with Disabilities. Okay, so the council will have to sway sure. you in. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. So just wanted to clarify on the accessory program. As you know, accessory is a state program uh, that's run by the MTA. So uh, they would have the data on that for uh, people who have caregivers that use that. But it's primarily for folks with disabilities. So obviously, if the person with a disability has a caregiver or PCA as part of that program, that's data that the MTA would have, and we can circle back with you if that's something you're interested in finding out. Good. I think that's, um, that would be good if you could help us get that data. And also on the, uh, you know, the, uh, the pilot program, I think we're interested in that too, because oh, that's, that uh, that's something that we've heard a lot of great stories about how it really changed people's lives. So. We wanted to be able to see how that's been utilized. Yeah, I believe there was an oversight hearing a few we yeah. um, months ago about that. So the MTA has certainly been in c communication with the council, and we, we certainly share the council's goal of expanding uh, accessory rights to those who need it. Yeah, but we want to know, like, how many uh, caregivers actually have already were involved in using that program. Yep. Uh, we will certainly circle back with our partners at the MTA, but it's not a city program, so... I ju just want to clarify that it's the NTA that would have the data, not the city. Okay. Thank you. But I'm sure you can help us get it, right? <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll work with you uh, to get that data. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Deutsch? Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Good so afternoon. I just have a, one question. Um, do you follow, um, do you follow um, any new construction for senior housing uh, that is being built throughout the city? Do we follow? You, yeah, do, do you know, like, do you follow, like, if there's any senior housing being built throughout the city, do you, like, follow to see, like, where these, oh. um, these new buildings are being built? Okay. Because I, I'm, what, what I'm seeing in my district is that many of the seniors, they're looking for housing, affordable housing, and we have to navigate and to try to find, uh, it's, it's even difficult for us to know, um, you know, where these, where these housing's being built throughout the, throughout the five boroughs, and so it ta it's very time-consuming uh, for my office when, we, when a senior comes in looking for housing. So I want to know that number one is if you do follow t to see you know, where, the, where these um, senior housings are being built, and also how you get the information out, and, and if you can share that information with the elected officials, so this way we know how to better respond to constituents who may, um, be, may, may end up being homeless if they don't find uh, housing. We have some knowledge of some of the development that's going on, and we also have knowledge of some of what we call the NORCs. You're quite familiar with those, which yes. are areas. And so what we can do is provide you a list of what those services are and use it as a springboard to, to discuss how we can share information on current housing. Are there any availabilities like currently in the five boroughs? 
that you know of? No, I, I, I can't speak to that, sir. You can't speak to that. Um, but it's something that you, I think that DIFTA should follow, right? And, and know what, what availabilities are available for seniors. Do you think it's something that the DIFTA should? I, uh, am, I, am, I am confident that our network of agencies, and I'm confident that our case management agencies are well aware of what the availability is of housing for seniors. I'm also quite pleased, as I reported earlier, that this administration has made a commitment to have 30,000 units dedicated to people over the age of 65 by 2026. Uh, but I am confident that those housing programs and those housing services, affordable housing services, available to, elder, uh, to older New Yorkers are known by this network of agencies. Okay, so I, I would ask you, um, I'd like to ask you if um, your office could reach out to my office, if, we, if I could have a, um, a, you know, a uh, workshop in my office where I can invite seniors uh, for them, for your office and these agencies and these not-for-profits, whoever's handling this, to help them navigate for those who are seeking affordable we'd housing. We'd be happy. We'd be more than happy to contact your office okay. and to look at that as a service uh, training, as also in other areas in terms of caregiving uh, specifically, if you're interested. Okay, we'll, yes. We'll reach out to your office. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I know that, uh, Council Member Deutsch, we need a lot more uh, affordable housing for seniors, because I know that JIFTA does have a list of senior housing with waiting lists. <laughs> and we know that a lot of seniors throughout the city, according to uh, the, the report done by uh, Live On, it's like over 200,000. And uh, a new building going up, it's, uh, we could find some of them on Housing Connect, but Obviously, it's not enough, and we have to really uh, continue to advocate. I'm glad yes, that the mayor mention, is putting Chair. priorities on Yes, so I'm looking at a, a, a property in my district. It's about 50,000 square feet. It's owned by DOT, okay. and I'm already speaking to city planning, and I want to develop there strictly a senior housing. It's right at the, right at the Coney Island, the Brighton Beach um, boardwalk. That would be great. We can all work together and work together with DIFTA to make it happen. We are always looking for sites uh, to build senior housing. As, as in my earlier portion of my testimony, uh, council member, we talked about housing is one of the biggest challenges we have for caregivers as well as non-caregivers in New York City. So thank you, Commissioner, thank you. Uh, for being here. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to continue to work with you uh, yeah. in your department and uh, especially around budget time to make sure that we get more funding <laughs> for the Department for the Aging for all the good work that you have done and will be doing. I want to thank you for your continued support and your strong advocacy. We can't do this without you. Thank you all. So we're going to call up the next panel. Antonio Coppola from uh, AARP. Host uh, Joey Costello from Sage, Mark uh, Salty from Mobilization for Justice, and Gina Glafelta from Live on New York. Uh, did everyone fill out a slip? Somebody left it, yeah. There's an extra body there. Yeah. I think she has something to say for our cast. 
Oh, okay, so. Oh, you're just gonna help answer questions? Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> you may begin, whoever wants to go first. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for holding this committee hearing. Uh, my name is Joey Costello. I am the assistant director of case management at SAGE. Um, as many of you know, LGBT elders face a myriad of challenges associated with aging, declining health, diminished income, the loss of friends and family, and ageism. LGBT older adults also face invisibility, ignorance, and fear of harassment and poor treatment. Compounding their challenges, LGBT elders are far more likely to live in isolation. In fact, LGBT older people are twice as likely to live alone, half as likely to be partnered, half as likely to have close relatives to call for help, and more than four times more likely to have no children to help them. In fact, nearly 25% of LGBT elders who SAGE serves have no one to call in case of emergency or a caregiver if needed. In absence of their families of origin to rely on for care and support, um, for many LGBT people, families of choice are their cornerstones of caregiving. These chosen families provide social, emotional, and physical support and often serve as advocates with medical, when medical needs arise. As an, LG, as an LGBT person ages, they turn to their family of choice to help them care for their needs. Because of their lack of family caregivers, their need for respite and supplemental uh, services is greater. The act of providing physical and emotional and perhaps financial support to an ill or aging person can lead to isolation, stress, and eventually caregiver burnout. All caregivers are susceptible to caregiver burnout. LGBT caregivers experience some additional factors that can increase caregiver burden and lead them to burnout more quickly. Whether an LGBT person a caregiver is providing care for a member of their family or of origin or a family of choice, it is apparent that this population needs meaningful and approachable direct services and support for LGBT caregivers. To better serve LGBT elders and their caregivers, SAGE's caregiving program offers a safe, welcoming community that helps caregivers navigate their current and future needs. As they provide care for a loved one, SAGE's caregiving program cares for them and in turn helps them prepare for the time in their life when they, need me care, they may need care themselves. Through this program, SAGE offers one-on-one -on -one counseling, group counseling, weekly caregiver support groups, educational seminars, and online resources, information on benefits, respite care, and help for caregivers planning for their future needs. SAGE's program is the city's only dedicated LGBT caregiving program, supporting LGBT caregivers through programs and services such as SAGE's caregiving program is one of the best ways for the council to have a positive impact on the lives of both LGBT caregivers and LGBT elders receiving care. Caregiver support will save money on costly long-term care and will keep care recipients in their homes. Thank you to the council for your continued commitment to our city's LGBT older people and caregivers. Your support has been instrumental in ensuring that SAGE is there for them. SAGE looks forward to working with the members of the council to support LGBT caregivers and ensure that more of our city's LGBT elders can engage and age in place. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Chin and members of the Aging Committee. My name is Antonio Coppola, and I am the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York. On behalf of our 750,000 members, age 50 and older here in New York City, some of which have joined us this afternoon, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the topic of unpaid family caregivers. Family caregivers provide an invaluable resource. Many are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This labor of love is worth $31 billion in unpaid care each year, statewide, and more than 13 billion here in New York City. Thanks to family caregivers' commitment, hundreds of thousands of older people are able to live at home rather than in much costlier and mostly taxpayer-funded institutions like nursing homes. 
I personally have heard directly from unpaid family caregivers about the many services they provide and the frustration that they feel when they do not have access to the resources or support they need to successfully meet the responsibilities they have undertaken. Adding to this stress, many caregivers have neither the time nor the resources to care for themselves. It is heartbreaking. I invite you to visit AARP's iHeartCaregivers.com website to read real first-hand stories of unpaid family caregivers here in New York. I want to applaud the City Department for the Aging for their survey of informal caregivers in New York City. It is a great first step in addressing the needs of New York City's unpaid caregivers. There are more than a few highlights that ARP would like to underline at this moment. There are an estimated 900,000 to 1.3 million unpaid caregivers in New York City. A majority of caregivers are women, at least 50 years old. More than half of caregivers provide at least 30 hours of care each week. At least one third of each caregiver group struggles financially. Information about available services is the top three most needed services for all caregiver types. One of the services with the highest levels of unmet need was respite care. At least one in four caregivers from each group need but do not receive it. And lastly, two of the most prevalent barriers to obtaining services are lack of knowledge regarding available services and income limitations. Because so much has been said regarding services, I want to focus in more on the financial strain of unpaid family caregiver experience. A 2016 AARP report on family caregiving and out-of-pocket costs found that family caregivers not only spend time and energy, but also a significant amount of their own money on caregiving. The overwhelming majority of caregivers, almost four out of five, incur out-of-pocket costs as a result of caregiving. In 2016, family caregivers spent roughly $7,000 per year, counting to 20% of their income on average. It also impacts their future income. Many family caregivers are also dipping into their savings, and one in six has come cut back on retirement savings. In addition to out-of-pocket costs, many caregivers experience strain that affects their professional and personal well-being. More than half of the caregivers in the study reported at least one work-related strain, such as change in work hours, taking paid or unpaid time off, and others. Many are cutting back on their own personal spending to accommodate for caregiving costs, with roughly half cutting back on leisure spending. These findings demonstrate the importance of not only education and assistance for caregivers, but also the need for financial assistance such as family caregiver tax credit that would help address the financial challenges of caregiving. In, 19, excuse me, in 2019, AARP commissioned a report with the Center for Urban Future, which revealed that the number of older adults in New York City, residents aged 65 and over, increased 12 times faster than the city's under 65 population over the past decade. There are now a record 1.24 million adults aged 65 and older living in the five boroughs. Between 2007 and 2017, the city added over 237,000 older adults, an increase of 24%. By comparison, the city's under 65 population increased by just 2%. There has never been a more crucial time for us to focus on the needs of family caregivers. Now more than ever, we need to ensure that family members have access to the services and resources they need to allow their older loved ones to age at home with dignity. Support for unpaid family caregivers is a priority for ARP both nationwide and here locally in New York City. We applaud the City Council and the Mayor for taking on this issue and we look forward to continuing the work together on finding solutions that will best support the lives of our city's fair, care, fair family caregivers. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. 
All right. Hi, my name is Jenna Gladfelder. I'm a public policy associate at Live on New York. Thank you, Chair Chin and the full committee for um, the opportunity to testify today. Live on New York's members include more than 100 community-based organizations that provide more than 1,000 programs serving over 300,000 older New Yorkers annually. These core services include senior centers, caregiver supports, home delivered meals, affordable senior housing with services, NORCs, case management, and home care. Through policy efforts, Live on New York advocates to increase funding and capacity for our members to meet the needs of older adults in their communities and enable them to thrive. All of the community-based organizations who contract with the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, to provide caregiver support services are within Live on New York's membership. For that reason, we wish to provide testimony today. We are incredibly grateful to the de Blasio administration for its increased investment in this important program. New York City has one of the most concentrated populations of older adults in the nation, and with that comes a significant amount of people caring for loved ones. DIFTA's caregiver supports uh, program offers assistance to many types of caregivers, from those caring for an aging loved one who may or may not have dementia, to grandparents raising grandchildren, to caregivers of adults with disabilities. According to DIFTA's latest progress report, there are 1.1 million caregivers in New York City, many of whom are women and people of color. For many caregivers, one of the biggest issues they face is financial. Many caregivers simply cannot afford to hire full-time care for a loved one, nor can they afford to stop working to provide full-time care themselves. In a number of ways, they find themselves stretched thin, financially, physically, and emotionally. Fortunately, DIFTA's caregiver program is able to look at each case holistically and determine where support is needed most. Time and time again, we hear from our members about the critical impact this program has on both caregivers and care receivers in New York City. Between providing respite, transportation, combating isolation, and promoting self-care, these programs are concretely improving the lives and mental health of its participants. Our members are uniquely poised to offer hyper-local caregiver support services, and they are proud to meet the needs of their communities through creative programming and strategic partnerships. DIFTA's report shows that caregivers in New York City are a diverse group of people, and our members are again uniquely poised to provide culturally competent services to the city's unpaid caregivers and shape their programs with sensitivity. Moving forward, Live on New York would love the city's support in responding to the state's forthcoming proposals through the second iteration of the Medicaid Redesign Team, or MRT2, which has uh, a, the task of cutting $2.5 billion in Medicaid spending. It is likely that the proposals that come out of the MRT2 could impact Medicaid recipients, which in turn could affect both caregivers and care receivers. Live on New York encourages the city to join us in calling on the state and MRT2 to ensure future cuts do not lead to adverse health impacts, nor should they disproportionately affect low-income seniors and their caregivers or put community-based nonprofits uh, financially at risk. In conclusion, Live on New York wishes to reiterate our continued support of, the New, York's, uh, of New York City's caregivers program uh, and we commend DIFTA for launching multiple citywide outreach campaigns and hope that these efforts can continue as many individuals find it difficult to self-identify as a caregiver and are still unaware of the impactful resources offered through the city. Live on New York remains committed to working with our city and nonprofit partners to make New York a better, fairer place to age. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Schulte. I'm a staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice in their Kinship Caregiver Law Project. Mobilization for Justice, or MFJ, envisions a society in which there is equal justice for all. Our mission is to achieve social justice, prioritizing the needs of those who are low income, disenfranchised, or have disabilities. We do this through providing the highest quality, direct legal, civil legal assistance, providing community education, entering into partnerships, engaging in policy advocacy, and bringing impact litigation. We assist with more than 25,000 New Yorkers each year. Our Kinship Caregiver Law Project helps stabilize families by providing civil legal assistance to caregivers raising children who are not their biological sons or daughters. This is thousands of grandparents, other relatives, and fictive kin who take over children whose birth parents are deceased, incarcerated, or otherwise unable to, or unwilling to provide a stable home. MFJ works to prevent these children from entering the traditional foster care system by representing caregivers in custody, guardianship, and adoption proceedings. Research has demonstrated a number of clear benefits of kinship care over the traditional foster care system, including improved academic performance, lower incident of mental illness, lower teen pregnancy rates, and improved self-esteem. MFJ's Kinship Caregiver Law Project is the only program in New York City serving the legal needs of kinship caregivers. 
Last year, thanks to a speaker initiative, MFJ was awarded funding to support our kinship work, wherein we served over 500 families, the vast majority of whom are working poor women of color. We appreciate the opportunity to share with the Committee on Aging information about the free legal assistance that we provide to the unpaid caregiver population, thanks to speaker initiative support as well as the support of this committee. Um, so I did want to just highlight a few of the things that we do and the legal obstacles that face our clients. Um, as you may know, grandparents and other kinship caregivers do not have the right to a court-appointed attorney in family court proceedings. Um, however, they're often asked to intervene in family court proceedings in order to stabilize their own families. Um, for instance, we receive calls each week from prospective caregivers who have reached a dead end. They know that a child they love has entered the traditional foster care system, but they cannot get the child into their care. Um, in these cases, the prospective kinship caregivers are anxiously seeking advice and assistance, and they often tell us that they've called agency after agency to no avail. In such a circumstance, often the only legal option for them is to intervene in an ongoing child protective proceeding in family court. Um, however, doing so can be quite daunting without an attorney. Um, these proceedings involve many parties. They involve ACS, which is represented in court by counsel. They involve sometimes both parents, who are often represented by separate counsel in family court. And they also involve a court-appointed attorney for the child. Um, these cases often involve 10 to 20 court appearances over the course of several years. And so navigating this process without a, an attorney can be quite daunting and can also often mean that their issues don't get before the judge at all. Um, Mobilization for Justice is the only organization that is dedicated to providing free legal services to this population. Um, under such circumstances, research shows that kinship care is overwhelmingly better for children and for families as a final result. However, without legal intervention at the appropriate stage, often this is not possible. Um, I also wanted to highlight some of the other work that our organization does outside the foster care system. Um, we also provide representation in private adoptions, and so these are situations in which a caregiver is caring for a child through a private arrangement with the parent, um, typically a grandparent or a great aunt. Um, these, often an adoption through family court, is the only way for caregivers to ensure that benefits through Social Security actually get to the children in their care. Um, however, filing an adoption in family court is virtually impossible without an attorney. It requires about 20 or 30 forms and a range of affidavits. And so we try to fill that gap by providing adoptions for those families. We also work with families to ensure that they're receiving appropriate public benefits. The vast majority of our clients live at or near the poverty level and under the federal guidelines, that amounts to an annual income of less than $24,000 for a family of four. The unanticipated costs of caring for one or more additional children with such limited funds places an enormous financial strain on our clients. Um, in some circumstances, foster care funding may be available. However, in many circumstances, it's not. In such a circumstance, their only recourse is to apply for a special non-parent cash assistance grant through HRA. Um, particularly, ironically, in our experience, it's often the most vulnerable clients that are not eligible for uh, foster care subsidies, and they're forced to, to rely on this non-parent grant, um, which is unfortunately much lower than the foster care funding that they would receive if they were actually certified or approved as a foster parent. Um, accordingly, we do advocate for the non-parent grant through HRA to be equitable to the foster care subsidy, which is, again, much higher than the grant that they receive through HRA. Um, we also provide representation in custody and guardianship cases. Um, these are also cases that are private arrangements not involving ACS intervention in which a grandparent or aunt or other kinship caregiver has taken over care of a child in need. Um, in our experience, um, under these less formal transfers, kinship caregivers often don't, can't, kinship caregivers who cannot afford to go to court often um, do not do so until there's an actual emergency, demanding emergency assistance. Um, under these circumstances, they often find themselves unable to make a significant medical or psychiatric decision. Um, they need to request a child's birth certificate, they um, require a child's social security card or to obtain a passport for a child or any number 
of needs in which they might actually suddenly need a legal order for the child. Um, we provide representation to caregivers in these circumstances to make sure that they are filing the right things, serving the right people, and as formally establishing their legal rights in an appropriate way and in a timely way. We also provide services to special immigrant, to um, recipients of a special immigrant juvenile status. This is a type of immigration relief in which an abused or abandoned child who is being taken over, who, whose care has been taken over by an adult in the United States can obtain immigration benefits for that child. Um, it does require family court intervention and we provide representation in those cases. Finally, we also provide representation in cases involving visitation. Um, maintaining kinship ties creates a sense of st stability for children in foster care, and, but often those children are cut off from grandparents. Um, MFJ provides advice and representation to grandparents who have been separated from their grandchildren um, in foster care cases and also in cases where their own children have died, where the, ch um, the parents are victims of domestic violence or where the children um, have actually been adopted out, out of the foster care system. To assist our clients, um, we collaborate with social services organizations, community groups, and other advocates to provide holistic services to kinship caregivers. Uh, clients access our services through a walk-in clinic at the Bronx Family Court, a telephone hotline, a know your, uh, through Know Your Rights trainings uh, throughout the city, um, and also through a clinic at Bridge Builders um, in the South Bronx. Uh, our attorneys chair the New York City Kinship Task Force and are leaders within the New York State Ken Care Coalition. Um, our attorneys educate the legal community about caregiver needs by providing continual legal education programs for advocates, courthouse staff, and pro bono attorneys. We engage in legislative advocacy to promote the interests of caregivers and their families. And attorneys also coordinate with MFJ's other projects uh, to assist caregivers with issues related to other things that we do within our organization, such as consumer protection, foreclosure prevention, housing, and other needs. Um, by providing meaningful access to legal services for kinship caregivers, families become stabilized if they access benefits to which they are entitled, secure their legal relationship to the children, and in some cases, secure immigration status for the children. Ensuring caregivers' rights are not only known but enforced makes for a more effective and safe system and better outcomes for all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do you, how do you do outreach? I mean, like, in terms of providing the information to the council members, to community organization, because, you know, I mean, we have constituents um, that needed this service, and so do you provide outreach material in different languages? Um, before you answer, we were earlier joined by Councilmember Traeger. Because um, the service you provide sound great. And I know we have constituents that really can use them. Uh, so do you provide outreach material in different languages? And I mean, simple enough that people can understand that if they are in this situation, they have this right, or like if they are facing this problem, that there are resources to help them. So we do have outreach materials in English and Spanish and French. Um, we do provide access to all of our services through a language line as well. So if somebody calls our um, hotline, they can communicate with an attorney through a language line. Um, and we do have Spanish speaking attorneys as well. Um, the most common way for people to get into contact with us is actually through a court referral. So often a caregiver will go to court um, and the clerk will tell them. Yeah, that but I'm, exist. what I'm asking is that people don't even know that they have to go to court, right? Correct. So that early part, I think that the outreach material to really give to people um, that are, don't even know that what the procedure is. And there, I mean, we have such, I mean, in my office, we had a tragic case where a mother died um, fighting for her child and the child just got into a foster care system and there were all the relatives that could have intervened, uh, but ACS and, and the agency, it just, they just couldn't, they just couldn't help them or whatever. Um, and now the child has lost um, the connection. So, I mean, from why I listen to your testimony, maybe there's a chance for the grandparents to figure out visitation rights. And for the father who was asked to abandon his parental right um, 
And it was so hard to find, you know, legal representation um, in the early stage. So I'm just, you know, my thing is like, if there are like information that we can let the community know that these options are available. Um, I have not been sworn in, can I, can I answer? Um, yeah, you no. can uh, answer questions. Right. Yeah. And, and identify yourself, I am. please. Uh, Tiffany Liston, I'm Deputy Director at Mobilization for Justice. Uh, so we try to address this problem specifically. Um, I've been going around with the Executive Director to as many constituent offices as I can, elected offices, to send around this information. We have kinship care one-pagers, um, we, we give out our hotline, so we're trying to reach as many constituents as we can. We're happy to send it to your office or to any other offices. Um, we've also been in touch with ACS, and so um, they have a resource guide uh, where we've provided our information and we're, we've been promised that, we are, that our information is being given out there as well. Um, but we, are, we continue to look for um, other opportunities to um, circulate our information. They're on our website, um, we're giving them out, but we're at you know, different CBOs, but we're, we, we're interested in the same um, efforts as well. Well, definitely send it out to our council office. You know, the link sure. and uh, the one pager, yep. and like in different you know, languages, I think that, that would definitely go a long way. Um, so that we can, you know, better serve the, the constituents. Um, we'll do. Uh, Mr. Costello, I know that you got, um, SAGE got the citywide contract uh, for caregiving program. Do you reach out to um, senior centers uh, to sort of start uh, giving out information? Because what I, it, um, like the centers in my district, you know, like for example, Center on the Square and um, the centers that actually could use some of those information uh, because they're elderly seniors, and I know that you know they don't have support services, uh, but they probably could use uh, some of the caregiver service. They themselves need the caregiver, uh, and they probably have friends uh, that they can call upon. So are you sort of also going out to some of these senior center? Um, we have, so we have five senior centers as well that are, are mm -hmm. you know, in the five boroughs that are, you know, basically. Well, th those centers. are the senior centers. Right. I assume they get the information. They do, <laughs> they do. Yeah, um, yeah, but I'm talking about all those senior centers. Right, um, we've done, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of tabling events, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of like where the community comes and so, you know, we're always trying to share and we'll go do presentations, um, you know, to inform people, but oftentimes people will just call or, you know, it, it's sort of a, more of a network thing, but I, I don't have the answer for you that we've like gone directly to other senior centers to be like, this is what Sage does. It's very similar, right? Because we have our own. Well, I would encourage you to come to some of mine. Oh, absolutely. And also the speakers district, because <laughs> yeah. they're located in the, you know, in the village, and uh, and I know some of my constituents. I mean, we will let them know. Um, because we also are getting the information from the Department of Aging, we'll send it out. Because I know some, uh, you know, active constituents that probably could use some, you know, support services. Absolutely. Um, so definitely, this is really good that that you are able to um, that we're able to provide the funding so that you can provide this uh, services citywide. Yes, we're very grateful. So thank you. Yeah. So thank you to all of you um, for your advocacy. And we just got to continue um, to have this issue uh, very visible so that people can come forward and identify themselves as caregivers and also be able to find the resources that they need uh, because the number is growing and we're still not you know, touching uh, a large portion of this you know, unpaid caregivers. So thank you again for being here today. Uh, and for all your great work. And I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, coming here and help us spread the word that there are resources available uh, to caregivers, especially the unpaid caregivers. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the next hearing. All right, thank you. Oh, Council Member Deutsch? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, although I'm, I'm sure you all do great work, but I just want to single out um, uh, Sage for the work they do on behalf of the veterans. So, I want to thank you, uh, Joey, and 
for all the, all the work that you do, and I'm proud that the New York City Council uh, funds SAGE um, a substantial amount of uh, funding for the older adults, so thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>